my name is Mike McKernan, and we are in some pasture land here in the summit area. We've grazed some game fish and parks ground. We have private ground and also some other rented private ground. So what we're doing here today is we have a study going on right now, just starting clipping plants and we'll be doing it throughout the year to get what the nutrient value is on these plants at different times in their growth stage. So starting from now in the spring of the early summer through to the fall, it's a, this is through a grant that the Grassland Coalition has gotten to uh, hire a couple techs. We're going statewide. We have, I believe, six locations across the state where we are collecting. We've uh, partnered, of course, through the Grassland Coalition. Um, our in-state partners include Game Fish and Parks, NRCS, SDSU Extension, The Nature Conservancy, Audubon, Ducks Unlimited, um, partnering with a more regional organization called the Xerxes Society, who's been conducting similar research in Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota, uh, in partnership with North Dakota State. So, got a lot of, lot of uh, players in this arena, and we're all ultimately concerned with keeping the native grasslands on the landscape, showing their value, championing their value, and then hopefully helping producers become even more profitable in their grazing enterprises. I got involved with this Forb Nutrition Project uh, through my job of being the beef nutrition field specialist there and trying to help more beef producers understand the value of these different plants in their pasture landscapes and that maybe the solution isn't necessarily going and spending a little bit more money at the feed mill for a specialized bag of mineral, uh, but better taking care of our pastures, reducing that use of chemicals and pesticides out here, and let nature do the work and make our job a lot easier and allow our cows to work more for us than us work for them. We actually did the clipping at my uh, one of the pastures I lease down in Douglas County because I do have a, a lease pasture down there that has pretty good diversity. Not as good as here, but pretty good diversity. The guy that I lease it from or the family I lease it from, the guy is uh, just a little bit older than I am. Uh, he got out of cattle about that 2020 time frame when you know cattle markets were just terrible. And three years ago. I think we were on a call and we were talking about the upcoming Eastern Grazing School. As, as someone who has benefited greatly from the educational events that are provided by the coalition, I am always looking for ways to make our educational events even better in the coalition. I'm always evaluating, second guessing, asking questions about what we can do. And so we knew we were coming up, but we were about a month away from the grazing school and we had been doing a little bit of um, forage clipping for the follow-up grazing program. And I, I, I brought it up on the call and I, I told Pete Bauman, I said, you know, we always tell people in this grazing school, we really harp on uh, just the, the relative low quality of Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome grass and extol the virtues of our warm season native grasses. But the reality is like we, we're just telling people this and why don't we have something to back it up? It wouldn't even be that hard. You take a dozen species, you go out, you sample them once, you send them down to Ward Labs, and we say, get some information on total digestible nutrients, crude protein, so that we have some solid background information. And he said, that's great, let's do that. So we did that the first year. I think that was 2022, because I think we've just done it two years. Um, and we sent the numbers down 2022 started wet got dry uh, and the numbers came back just perfect they were perfect for making our point that something like uh, smooth brome grass by the end of july really low total digestible nutrients really low crude protein even if you're just testing the leaves of it uh, it's really past its prime by a, quite a long ways but you take something like big blue stem that's really in the middle of its growth spurt and uh, 
you, you just look at the numbers and you can, you can actually put real dollars into the value of that native plant forage. And we said that was great. You know, people, people really appreciate that information in the grazing school. We got some really solid feedback. So the second year we actually did it twice. We took uh, samples two weeks apart and then ended up just right before the grazing school um, that was the second one so that we could, we could start to show it through time. Went really well. Last year we had some middle of summer rains and so our forage numbers were not as discrepant, right? Because uh, as we were getting rain, the, uh, the smooth brome was staying more green and, and a little bit happier and thus had better nutritional quality. Uh, but then we worked with the Xerxes Society, uh, found out that they had been doing a similar native plant project predominantly focused on the native forbs. So we had tested a couple of the native forbs, uh, one of them being purple prairie clover. I know Pete's done some work on goldenrod in the past. We did focus a lot on the grasses, but the Xerxes Society was focused on the forbs uh, as they're really interested in the insect and pollinator populations. We partnered up with them, the coalition, uh, talked with them and said, hey, how can we expand the work that you've already done? And so that has led into the project that's going on this summer, where we have uh, a couple of people with SDSU going out and they try to spread them out across a big portion of the, the state so that we can get the best information possible. And they're trying to collect, uh, I think it's 30 species at three different life stages. So pre-boom, bloom, and then as they're starting to senesce so that they can get a, a full picture of both the life cycles of these plants across the state, when are they blooming in, diff in different parts of the state, as well as the nutritional qualities um, not only crude protein and total digestible nutrients, but also what kind of minerals are they providing? Because we know that our livestock to stay healthy require a certain amount of minerals um, and different minerals at different times, and whether it's breeding or post calving or, or whatever, that they need those minerals. And so if they can pick those minerals up through the forage, that's actually a real value to a cattleman as well. Um, ultimately, I think in my mind, the goal is to, to prove out through research the value of these forbs in the prairie ecosystem to just say it's not all about the grasses the grasses aren't like they're important certainly the cattle eat a lot of grasses but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of monetary value actually in maintaining your forb community and and if you need to control your weeds doing it you know on a much more limited basis or a spot basis rather than blanket spraying the entire pasture and, and removing a lot of those forbs and then just having grass left we're thinking the research will really tell us that that is probably not the best way to make money in the cattle business or in the livestock business. Most producers um, see grass just as grass. And in my hand, I'm holding two exotic species, Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome. And I think most of our producers are, are content with seeing green and green grass and thinking, I've got a healthy pasture. This is basically one food source of maybe a hundred that might be available on a, healthy, on a healthy pasture. So the idea that we only want to manage for green growing grass is a bit of a falsehood in range management. Um, there's not a lot of uh, long-term benefit to that. And these are indicator plants of a fairly potentially unhealthy system. They're invasive, um, they're fairly low nutrition, uh, cool season grasses that ultimately kind of blink out in a dry summer like we've had the last few years in eastern South Dakota. So the acceptance of something that's not very good and the attack on things that might be good that we don't understand very well. And so in my hand on, the, in the, on this side is a native thistle called a floodman's thistle and on this side is goldenrod. Both of these plants are generally, at the, at the most basic level, thistle and weed. And that's what a lot of our producers see on the landscape. Thistles or other weeds. All of them have no place in the, in the system. And that's really a falsehood. Um, first of all, we have a lot of native thistles, or a few species anyway in this area. And what do they provide? Uh, that's what we're here to find out. We're actually collecting these plants. We know that livestock forage on these things at certain times. We just don't know a lot about it and, and the nutritional value that they provide throughout the growing season. And this hand is goldenrod. And goldenrod really is the bane of a lot of producers. They, they learn to hate it from each other, more or less. 
and certainly it can occupy space in a pasture. But uh, you've heard from Mike McKernan already, and Mike and I were part of a study, uh, a small pilot study we did years ago, where we trained livestock to eat goldenrod, only to find that Mike's old cows in our control herd were already eating it anyway. But what they do is they nip about the top, maybe inch or two off, and you can't really tell. I mean, a goldenrod plant looks like a goldenrod plant, even if it's been nipped off. And I think we were missing the boat on that plant. We tested that plant simply for uh, protein analysis, and it, it, it graded out as high as uh, dairy grade alfalfa, somewhere around 24% uh, crude protein on that plant. Uh, the thistles grade out very high as well. So the point is, when you've got a diverse grassland, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for nutrition and mineral consumption for those livestock that's provided by nature. We've just forgotten to take a hard look around to see what these animals are doing. I think a lot of it is our own patterns. Um, how often are we out there actually watching livestock forage? Um, very little. You might be moving them a little bit, you might not be moving them at all. So this assumption that they're only eating grass is really a falsehood and there's 24 hours in a day. These plants have turpins and tannins and they have different components that ebb and flow their sugars throughout the day from sunrise all the way to sunset and through the night. We don't really know what those animals are eating when they get up in the middle of the night and go consume forage. So the premise of this study, even before we create a, a, a video on why not to spray, we wanna create the foundation as to what is the value of these plants? If we're gonna ask you not to spray for all of the diversity and wildlife reasons, we need to give you something in return for helping the producer understand the actual economic value of these plants. Every bite that, uh, that an animal might take off of a goldenrod, maybe one less purchase you need to make from the bag or the jug to supplement minerals or other nutritional goals for your livestock. That's the background. So what are we doing here as far as the actual project? Um, again, we've been conducting similar research in Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota uh, in partnership with North Dakota State. So we've got a lot of, lot of uh, players in this arena and we're all ultimately concerned with keeping the native grasslands on the landscape, showing their value, championing their value and then hopefully helping producers become even more profitable in their grazing enterprises.